Just say that. Say that again, please. Jonathan Newman, Central City Extra. Thank you. Susan Bryan, uh, uh, videographer, Alliance for Better District Six Tennis Association Coalition. Oh, okay. My name is Carmen Lee. I'm with People with Disabilities Foundation, and I left a flyer. We have a housing workshop October six at the library. Okay. Well, we do announcements at the end. Oh, okay. Wait, wait. Okay. All right. Okay, I'm Alexandra Goldman, community planner with TNDC. Thank you. Tim Slobota with YWAM and a resident of the neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. Um, first item we have on the agenda is uh, group housing projects in the Tenderloin. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Legislation regarding um, group housing and our defined by different things like the size of the room or the amenities provided involved with the housing. And each type of housing sort of has different requirements associated with that type of housing. So in San Francisco, there's a specific type of housing that's called group housing. And what that means is um, it's a room that's supposed to be less than 350 square feet. And it also doesn't have a complete kitchen. So what that means actually very technically is that there isn't an oven in the unit. So it's a lot of single room occupancy hotels are group housing. Um, some of them are not. Basically, most housing units in San Francisco can either be called a dwelling unit or a group housing unit. And a dwelling unit just basically means that it's larger than 350. Well, it doesn't have to be larger, but it does have a complete oven. Yeah. What if it's under 300 square feet but has an oven? That would be a different, that would be a dwelling unit, but there are, uh, there are specifications about the size that a unit can be. You might have heard recently about micro units. Um, those are basically, they have ovens in them, but they might be, I don't know how big they are, but they, they had to seek special exemptions in order to make units that small. Because the planning code, you know, has certain standards that are, loosely based on ideas about health and sanitation and how much space human beings need to live. And so they had to seek an exemption in order to build micro units, um, which they did a few years ago. Um, the, the, the reason why this matters uh, is that if you build group housing units, you get, to, you get special exemptions. You can build more units. The, the city decides that you don't have to have the same setbacks, so you don't have to build a, a rear yard, or you don't have to have front setbacks, 
Um, and the, the main thing that I'm here really to talk about is the fact that if you built group housing, you weren't subject to the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. The inclusionary housing ordinance is uh, a law that was passed in the early 2000s. A lot of cities across the United States have similar ordinances. And what it basically says is that when you build new market rate housing, you also have to set aside a certain percentage of that housing for uh, affordable housing. So in San Francisco, that means that if you build more than 12, uh, more than 12 units of housing in one project, 12% of those units have to be affordable. Does that make sense? I'm sure people have heard a little bit about this. You, so you either have to build 12% of the units on site as affordable, or you can build 20% of them someplace else. So if you wanted to make a bunch of super luxury condos and you didn't feel like making any of those affordable to lower income people, you could sponsor a project and build 20% of your units elsewhere as um, affordable. So if you built group housing up until recently, you didn't have to go, you didn't have to follow this ordinance at all. Because usually, Group housing, as we used to think about it, was not a place that wealthy people would want to live, right? They're small units, they're tightly packed together, they don't have a complete oven. It used to be that, you know, the only people who would want to live in those were people who couldn't afford to live someplace that was larger and had a, a large oven. Um, and so group housing was oftentimes SROs, like I said. Sometimes group housing was used for frat houses or used for, like, um, transitional housing, either for people who've been having medical issues or other issues, so it was sort of like a special type of housing. Now, with the crazy housing crunch that we're having, all of a sudden wealthy people, or wealthier people, are willing to pay $2,000, $2,500 to live in these tiny units. And so, as you know, capitalism works, people realized this and started trying to build these units um, for this wealthier demographic. So. Uh, the, according to their, the market studies of these developments, they were imagining people who were earning well above $80,000 were going to be wanting to live in these units. And so uh, legislators and community activists were like, this is kind of a problem because the only reason there was an exemption here was because it was all affordable to begin with. Now none of it's affordable and they are basically circumventing their uh, inclusionary requirements. Can I just... Take a pause. Am I saying anything that makes sense? I think my brain isn't like quite functioning as smoothly as normal, so I just want to make sure I'm not using terms or referring to things that are not clear. I'm just going to clarify. So you're saying that group housing is not subject a subject to the inclusionary housing requirement. It wasn't. It was not. Yeah. Until until well, early July, which is the so next part of the. We're talking about the legislation, and that's why yeah. the legislation changed that. So this is the background. Through the agenda. So this yeah, is okay. so this is what happened. This is what was true before early July. Okay. Yeah. Did you have another follow-up question? No, I just need to okay. Yeah. yeah. So so basically, so um, supervisors Avalos and Kim found this was sort of problematic that there was a loophole for this type of housing, and so they introduced legislation um, in the spring to address this particular issue. Um, and that legislation was passed in early July. So that means now that you can't, just by keeping an oven out of your unit, it doesn't get you out of your affordability requirements. Um, so that that's basically um, a summary of what happened in regards to the legislation. Are there questions about that? Yeah. Okay, is that a, a legislation effective immediately? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was also in the legislation, it was written in that any project that hadn't received their final construction permits, so if you're building a project, there's a lot of permits and approvals you have to get. The construction permits are basically the final ones. So this meant that any project that had already started but hadn't sort of received its final approvals would be subject to this ordinance. So there's some projects in the, there's well, there's one project in particular in the Tenderloin and a few in Soma that would be subject to this requirement, even though they had started the process before this legislation went into effect. Some people think that's unfair, but that's how it goes. Could you describe again what's your definition of a micro unit? A micro unit? I don't know what the size is, but it's basically, um, there was a law that said that a, a dwelling unit 
has to be more than a certain amount of square feet. I, I, I don't know offhand what it is. Let's say it's 300. It's probably not, but it's somewhere around 300. So because there's such a, an affordability crunch, people were like, well, in a, way, a way that we can make units more affordable is to make them smaller. So a few years ago, even as far as like three or four years ago, they began seeking exemptions so that they could make units smaller. And a lot of these micro units are, um, they have a full kitchen, but they're very small and they have sort of like a, what you, a Murphy bed and they have all these sort of like other furniture that helps maximize the small space. And these units are, are marketed at wealthier people. They're not marketed at who we traditionally think of as low income people. Um, so there's some like the panorama or panoramic, that's a building that I think opened recently that is mostly micro units and they're renting for close to $2,000 if not more, which is kind of, they're basically tiny, tiny studios. And they're like SRO hotel rooms, like a small SRO hotel room with a kitchen and a bathroom. Um, so part of the, moving on to the, the next agenda item, which sort of goes into this, part of the reason why they introduced this legislation was that there are a couple projects planned for the neighborhood that um, we're, we're going for this group housing model. Um, and one of them is at Turk and Leavenworth. There's sort of two, two buildings that are part of the same project. Um, but one of the other things about group housing is that one of the ideas behind it is that it's sort of more of a communal sort of living situation, that you might not have much space to hang out in your unit but that there are large shared public spaces that, you, that sort of foster a communal lifestyle. And so some, some of the people who have been wanting to make group housing units have really seized on this idea and have sort of wanted to foster more of like a, com a community. And they've, you know, they have a website that's like, talks about all these sort of more hippie type ideas about housing. Um, and, you know, I think that there's, there's room for that. Um, if people want to live in a more intentional community with smaller private spaces and larger shared spaces. But a lot of these projects weren't really, didn't really seem to be going with that ethos. They seemed to be sort of taking advantage of the exemptions that group housing afforded them, rather than trying to promote sort of a more communal lifestyle. Um, so one of those types of projects is the one that's planned for the Tenderloin. They had kind of minimal common space. It was pretty clear that what they're doing is marketing their units towards um, tech workers, basically, because tech workers are a segment of the population who make a fair amount of money and also have a lot of their meals provided for them on site. So they have less of a need for a private kitchen than most other people do. Um, so they were planning this project. They weren't going to include any affordable housing. They hadn't done, they had done very minimal community outreach um, and they, uh, they were going to build really close to a lot of the surrounding buildings, which are affordable. Sorry. Um, that a lot of community groups found to be problematic. One was that they weren't including any affordable. Second one was that they hadn't done any community outreach and they also had said they had done it when they hadn't done it. And the third was that they were gonna build very close to surrounding affordable buildings and um, sort of destroy the access to light and air that a lot of the people who lived in these buildings um, needed. Um, so if you only have one room, one window in your room, if that window is a few feet away from another wall, it's going to significantly decrease the quality of your uh, life. So a bunch of community groups uh, and members got together to sort of push this developer to um, change all of these things, to include uh, affordable units, to um, increase the setbacks between their building and other buildings, and to do meaningful community outreach. Um, and we were pretty successful in doing that in um, the late spring, early summer. Um, and the developers agreed to increase the setbacks. They did more outreach. They came to this meeting. Um, and uh, 
they agreed to put 12% affordable even before this legislation passed in July. So they made the sign sort of a private agreement with um, TNDC, where I work, that said they were going to put 12% affordable <coughs> in the building. Um, so that, that project has been approved. It's received its entitlements. Um, they haven't received, as far as I know, their construction permits, which, like I said, is sort of the last thing they need to do. But it's sort of, that's more of a perfunctory thing. It's not, um, the, I mean, they'll get their construction permits. So they're gonna begin construction on that next year. Uh, one of the things they're really excited about is it's sort of more modular construction. So they're like basically prefabricating a lot of the parts of it in the Central Valley and then trucking it in here. So what they're hoping is that, what they're telling us is they're hoping this will minimize the disruption that is inherent in a construction project. But what they're not telling us is that construction in San Francisco is very expensive right now. And so they're also saving a lot of money by fabricating a lot of their building in the Central Valley. So um, did everyone get this? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this, if you look at this map, you can see um, 351 Turk and 145 Leavenworth. The labels are kind of overlapping. But that's the project I'm talking about. Um, if you look at Turk and Taylor, you can also see one that's called 105 Turk. That one is very early in the process. It's a land owned by uh, Mosser, who owns other buildings in the Tenderloin, and they've indicated that they would like to turn that site, which is currently a parking lot, into group housing units as well. Okay, I got a question. When they talk prefab housing, yeah. the word comes up formaldehyde. Yeah, you know, some of these, you know, like uh, I mean, some of these modular things, are, you know, and in the past, uh, the uh, housing uh, that was provided to the refugee, to the uh, climate refugees from, uh, 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 what was it, Katrina, and all that made people very sick. Yeah. I and also these. The second question is, the tech workers, you know, like they're kind of like what they call. They, they're kind of considered, uh, what is it called, um, not temporary, but expendable, and uh, what happens is when a company sloughs off a lot of its workers, what happens is these people will no longer be able to, to, to live where they're living, and at right. 2000 for a tiny apartment, you know, even if they got a good salary originally, they're going to be in right. bad shape. Right. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people have that concern about the group housing. Is that how sustainable is it for us having people who are paying that much money to live in the tenderloin in these really expensive units? So I think people do have a concern that um, not only, you know, pe people have concerns about market rate development in the neighborhood, right? Because of gentrification and displacement. But people also have concern that people moving into these units are not going to want to stay and put down roots and be contributing parts of the neighborhood that there's going to be a high turnover and that you know if the bubble pops or if it deflates at all that you know they're going to be seeing a really di different demographic who wants to move into these rooms than the people that they're considering right now well these will be the new homeless That's possible. okay i mean this is i mean this is you know i mean we got to consider all these things yeah yeah so i mean that's a lot of people have raised that objection to this to group housing um, is it just, is it the type of development that we want in this neighborhood? Um, is, is sort of like temp housing for tech workers. Uh -huh. Because as you all probably know, um, new developments in San Francisco are not covered by the rent control ordinance. So that means that the rents in these new buildings can fluctuate however the, the management wants it to, as long as it's not violating the lease. So you know, most people move in and sign a year lease, and their rent is pretty much stable for that year. Mm -hmm. And then after their lease runs up, the landlord's free to do whatever they want with the rent if it's not under if it's not rent controlled. So that's the case with all these units. So who know you know who knows what sort of instability we'll see here? Right, and we have a lot of instability in this neighborhood uh -huh. to begin with. Yeah. And like I say, this is this is a something waiting to happen. Yeah. So you know. As the 105, so 
Turkey Leavenworth is kind of a done deal. Um, I don't really think there's much we can do other than work with the management company to ensure that they're good neighbors um, about this project. But if you know uh, people want to 